More important than anything else, dear people, uh, is we, we have to see the power of God revealed in the earth. You and I have got to lift up our voice and begin to cry out, O oh, sovereign Lord, revive again the wor your work in the midst of us as in the days of old. And, you know, I, I believe that, you know, there's a lot of talk about harbingers or tokens or signs of the time, but the greatest harbinger of all is the outpourings of God, the, the harbinger of the restoration of all things. It's the harbinger of the fact that Christ Jesus is about to take his power and reign. And I kind of look at it like this, you know, um, the Lord's on a different time scale than we are, you know, and, and it's hard for us to imagine because we think the whole universe centers around what we know, but really it doesn't. And uh, it's as though he's been stepping one step at a time towards coming and getting his church and ultimately having the marriage supper of the Lamb and all the beautiful things that go on with that that he's planned out. Because I'm telling you, the Lord knows how to throw a party. It is amazing. He knows how to celebrate life. And then when he's done with that, we're going to come and rule and reign with him in the midst of the surf for a thousand years as he does one last gleaning to bring in the last you know, group of people that are willing to cooperate with his life plan, with his glory plan, with the way he purposed it all to be. God gets it his way. People might not like it, but Papa gets it his way. He's the one who just created it all and decided it all, and then everybody gets to decide whether or not they want to cooperate, but he's not changing his plan. He's got a good one. He's sticking with it, and I'm so happy about that. Yeah. He's God. He doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he said, to come, and he's going to, in his mercy, he's going to reign for a thousand years after what we call the Great Tribute is finished and my goodness is it ever lining up you know ten years ago people would have said there had been no possibility of she's crying out for prayer would you like to say something there had been no possibility Lord Jesus touch her I'm gonna stop for a minute you know anybody's gonna cry out you know we're gonna if you start crying out in the midst of the meeting, it's not, throw them out, you know. Father, touch her right now in Jesus' name. Whatever's, if she needs more food, we just thank you for the provision of it. <laughs> Hallelujah. It doesn't, I mean, for the natural eye, it doesn't look like it. Touch her right now, Father, in Jesus' name. <laughs> Hallelujah. God, I'll suck in, but I'll tie Hallelujah. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that she'll have enough of what it takes to make it through the night hour that she's going to live through. In Jesus' name. Yes. Let, let the anointing come upon her. That's the bacaleo. Hala basere. Hala maketa. Jesus torinea. Thank you, Lord, for baptizing her right now in your presence. Yes. Baptize dad yes, Lord. and mom afresh in Jesus' name. And, and help baby get more food. <laughs> Ten years ago, that's where it was. Ten, yeah, <laughs> ten years ago, if you'd have said there's going to be some kind of an alliance between Syria, Iran, and Iraq, people would have said there's, well, there's no way. If you'd ask a person from the Middle East, it's like, you know what, you know, there's no way. The, Sunni, the Shiite and Sunni division is just too deep. But right now, we're actually seeing the formation of something that the, the Word of God had talked to us about long ago. And um, we've seen the struggle of it. And you can say, well, we can look back in, 19, in, the, in, the, in the early 1900s, and late 1890s, and we can see the struggle of it. Yeah, but not like now. And we can look back and we can see the mid-1940s and into 1950, especially with a star on 1948, the struggle of it. Yeah, but not like now. We could talk about all the trouble that's been in the Middle East centered around this little nation of Israel. Give me a break. What's the probability of that? Show me where are the... Show me, we're the ancient Spartans. We're Sparta. I mean, because it'd be the same. It's on the same level. We're Sparta. You know, Let, let's, you know, we could go on and on with the civilizations that don't even exist anymore. There's something very unique that everybody better stand up and pay attention to. And there's no one on this planet right now who has been given the authority to wave the flag, to, to, to flash the, 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 the bright, uh, you know, uh, beaming lights, floodlights, of God's purpose and God's per plan as the churches because the Lord Jesus Christ, he commissioned the church. He, he did something for us that goes beyond all of our imaginations. He came and he purchased our salvation at Calvary. There at that moment in time, he opened up the prison doors and liberated all men, anyone who wanted to believe, 
to be able to come out of a realm of darkness under the control of demon spirits and step over into a realm called heaven to now live under the, his government and under his rule. People don't believe this, but Christ Jesus actually has already been coronated King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He already is ruling. People think it's going to be someday in the future. It is not. I'm going to lay these things out for you today, this morning, and also tonight. Once again, because I want you to be established in it. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28, and verse 18, He said, All authority is given to me in heaven and earth. Paul, talking of this thing, uh, this same thing in Philippians, to the Philipp church at Philippi, said in Philippians chapter 2, And Father has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name in this world and also in the world to come, that it by, at his name every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. And people think that's up in the future somewhere. No, it's now. It's now. And if our gospel be hid, it's hid from those whom Satan has blinded their eyes, the God of this world, the spirit of this world, the prince of the power of the air. But see, reality of it is, is the Lord gave to his church. See, a scepter went forth out of Jerusalem on the day that the power of the Holy Ghost came upon the church and baptized them in the Holy Ghost and fire so that we might go everywhere with his administrative authority and power to execute his will and his righteousness in the earth. And that's mighty signs and wonders and miracles because anytime heaven is revealed, that's by definition signs, wonders, and miracles. Anytime heaven is being revealed, that's by definition supernatural. And Satan had a strategy and he executed executed that strategy to imprison all those who would believe in a place where they now are captured by a realm called religion and they have no ability to show forth the glory of the only begotten Son. Thus, they argue among one another. They seek after riches and wealth and houses and lands and, and, and live in a self-centered realm that ultimately has an outworking of every evil thing of strife and division, just like in the world. And why should the world want just more of the same that they are already miserable with? Does that make sense to you? Well, that's what's going on. And some of us have this passion. We were born with it. See, we were born for such a time as this, and we recognize that if we should be unwilling to go, then the Father will raise up deliverance from some other source, from some other realm, from some other place. I, for one, am going to stand alongside of Mordecai and Esther as they stood at their day and their generation as a, as a memorial, as a token for all time to come that said, no, 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 I'm going to lay down my life that the purposes and will and plan of God might be revealed. I'm going to be willing to be an instrument of the miraculous plan to destroy and, and capitulate that which has gone forth as an edict from the king that seems so impossible to ever change but God will change it if somebody would go and lay down their life and sacrifice themselves. Jesus did that for us. And through the veil of his flesh, because it was ripped wide open, you and I have the privilege of stepping out of the lust of this world, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life to step over into the beauty and the splendor of his servitude, of his beauty, of his righteousness, of his holiness. And you're going to have to deal with the stuff that you've not been willing to listen to God about because your stuff's not coming in to his kingdom. It's not coming in, and there's no sanctification in the sepulcher. You're going to have to be willing to be consecrated to his lifestyle now. And the beautiful thing of it is God in his mercy has given to you and I the best mentor, the best teacher that we possibly could ever have. And it is the person, the Holy Ghost himself, who's come to lead us and guide us, who's to come to be with us and on the inside of us, who's come to go before us and behind us, who's there come to compel us with divine unction and purpose, who's come to give us the insight so that we can understand all the truth, to unveil the word of God, to reveal Jesus to us, to be lo the love of God on the inside of us, to be the power of God and the force of God through our lives. Listen, we were without excuse. Listen, we without excuse. I know what's going on now. I'm a little slow, but it, it, it takes me a little while to get it. But I know what's going on now. I know that if you want to be a popular Christianity and you want to be a minister that everybody believes speaks the truth, then you have to be able to find a definition for the life of Jesus Christ in the world, in the world culture, in the, in the world's disobedience, in the world's promiscuousness, in the world's rebellion, in the world's defiance, in the world's demonic influence. I'm not going to do that. God didn't do that. Jesus did not come, die at Calvary's cross, go down into hell, defeat all the powers of darkness, raised from the dead the third day, so that you cannot, and I could now be right while we intercourse with demon spirits. Pretty radical, isn't it? Could you actually believe that I'm actually speaking by the Spirit of the Father? 
that I could actually possibly be speaking by the Spirit of the Son right now, that it could actually be the Spirit of the living God testifying through me as an act of His mercy, declaring, proclaiming His word, crying out, saying, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come learn of me. Take my servitude upon you. His servitude is very clear what his servitude is. He lived to do only the will of the Father. He said it for you and me to live only to do the will of the Father. And he said it in the most radical terms. And people think that that is a terrible sacrificial life. No, it's walking in the good life. It's walking in the abundant life. It is walking in the God life, which is eternal life, an unending life, a life that has no diminishing with the using. Everything else you know and that I know in this world, it diminishes with the using. But in God, it just keeps getting better. There is no diminishing. It just keeps getting better. It multiplies upon itself as you interact with it. It's true. This is the ways of God. He's, he's, he's just absolutely amazing. This life that he's brought us into, it will not mix. It cannot mix. It just gets stopped. It gets prevented. As soon as you give way to things that demon powers would suggest and draw you back into, all it does is dull your senses. All it does is it makes you stupid concerning the things of God. It makes you dull. It makes you unaware. You lose your sight. You lose your true spiritual vision. You lose your spiritual instincts. You lose your spiritual understanding. You lose your spiritual hearing. All of a sudden, all of these lies and nonsense begin to make sense. All the fairy tales that Satan tells begins to be a story that you're willing to believe. God becomes more and more aloof as you find yourself drifting into the darkness and chasm of sin. Don't participate. Jesus came to set us free, came and opened up the door so that you and I could be liberated from a prison. And you know, and I, I, you know, I guess that I would be happy to some degree spending my life just telling people, I write unto you, you little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I think I could be okay with that if that was what God told me to do. And perhaps there are some ministries that that's all they're supposed to do because people gather unto them because there's nothing else they will ever be able to achieve because of their unwillingness to do what God said. And that is to take up their cross and follow him, which is literally to do nothing but the will of the Father. But I don't believe that the vitality of life ultimately will result in someone staying a baby forever. I think that we can only begin to proclaim that in the, in the, in the context of truth from which it belongs. That moment in time, that, that position that you have that is temporal, that is the stepping stone towards the maturity that God demands. For I write unto you, young men, because the word of God abides in you and you've overcome the wicked one has got to be a natural progression of truth. Paul writes out and he says in Ephesians chapter 4, he gives us two positions in which we can live. He says, 1A, you come into the fullness of the measure, the maturity of the ministry of Jesus, even unto a fully matured man. Or 2, you are going to be, remain as little babes and you're going to be tossed to and fro. And ultimately, he says, you will be overcome by the trickeries of men. Then I, I say that what he's writing to, the, when he said that to the church at Ephesus and what he said to the church at Corinth and, and when he talked to the churches being carnal, uh, behaving themselves as mere babes, that he gave them a warning that they were near to destruction and losing it all. Anyone who says, I can stay a babe and just want to remain a babe to be as a, as a means to justify wrongdoing, their heart's not right. Their heart's not right. Father's called you and I to come and deny ourselves. Jesus denied himself, and he had one holy self, and he had one good self, and there's not a better self that's ever been born of men than his self. I mean, there, we, could have, we could have boasted in his self. We could have delighted in his self. His self was far above anybody else's self, no matter who, what great person or what great accomplishments they may have made. His self was far above anyone else's self, and he said, I deny it. People always talking about themselves. Oh, I'm not a bad guy. Oh, I'm not a bad person. Oh, you know, I do this and I do that. But after all, you know, I believe I've got an understanding with the man upstairs. First of all, listen, you can't be that disrespectful to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And, and first, and, you know, and then secondly, my goodness, there is no understandings, there's no agreements to be struck. There's no more covenants to be made. He made a covenant to where that we become one with Him and our lives are in His life and His life is in our life and you can't see any difference. There's no such thing anymore as a theological transcendent other that God is different from us and He's far away from us and He's aloof from us. He's talking about He's come and made our, His abode in our life. And, 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 and you know what? And the Lord says to us, give all diligence to make your calling and election sure. Because there should, because a promise being left to you, if you shouldn't, labor to enter into it, you're going to fall after the same manner of unbelief as those whom the gospel was first preached to. And that's Hebrews chapter 3 and Hebrews chapter 4. I want you to recognize today, people, I'm going to be talking tonight about the authority that God has given to us, the scepter that has gone forth out of Zion. I'm going to talk to you about His authority and His power that has gone forth out of the realms of His kingdom so that His reign of righteousness and his reign of truth might be uh, encountered by all men and as distinctively through the church baptized in the Holy Ghost and fire and not sitting in your living room making excuses of why you don't have to go to the meeting or listen to the preacher. Should I say all of that again? It's a good thing it's being taped. But I, here's what I know. I know about the Word of God and how powerful it is. You might not remember what I said. You might not be able to perfectly quote what I just said, but I'm telling you in the Holy Ghost, you've got a photographic memory. Believe you me. I'm telling you, when the Word of God goes forth, it's seed, it's sown in your heart. It's going to come up and it's not weeds. And you can't stop what God's going to do if you're real with Him. I mean, the seed of God's Word will not return void. It will accomplish those things which He's purpose. You almost got to purposely go in there and cut it down with the acts of rebellion. Just don't, be, just don't resist the Holy Spirit. Don't resist God. I was talking to some preachers the other day and just saying about how that in the third world countries that we go to, they have no ability to resist. They, the reason they have no ability to resist is because they've not sit in church week after week and their hearts become hardened because they're, we, they're, they're, because they're willing to be right, not do right. They're willing to have good doctrine but not have a practice of it. They're willing to say that I go, but don't go. Hmm? And then point the fingers at everyone who does go, but said they wouldn't. Somebody was talking to me about Reinhard Bonnke. My question to them was, well, what would you have done differently? And they've never reached two or three people. And he's reaching 16 million. You don't even have the right, you don't even have the right to say nothing. You don't even, you don't have, it's like coming in, it's like coming in, well, it's worse than this, but let me just use it. It's like coming in to a person, you know, doing a neurologist doing brain surgery on somebody and giving him a recommendation on what he should, what he should be doing. And you didn't pass first grade. It was decided really early on, on life that you didn't have the skill set to go on through school, so this went ahead and gave you a trade. And you're there telling the neurologist what he ought to do. Stop. Be sober. It isn't hard to know how to be sober. You know, Paul said, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought, but be sober. It's not hard to be sober. What have you done with what you know? Now you can be sober. You can sober, but you can still be, you can be sober, but in expectation, more than hopeful, in expectation that God will increase the anointing in your life and use you more. But as soon as you begin to violate things in the spirit and you begin to have a, a, you know, have a big mouth, you know, that's the Antichrist. A little horn with a big mouth. Are we all right? Little power, big mouth. Because horn represents power. Little horn, little power, big mouth. Right? You just violate things in the spirit. You don't get to go forward. You're stuck. You're stopped. Huh? Then you can make your excuses and talk about how you lived a good life and you did what you thought was best. But you know what? That isn't what the Lord Jesus called you and I to do. I believe that God has got a whole line of witnesses. A whole great cloud of witnesses, a whole great company of saints that counted everything as dung for the beauty of being a part of his kingdom. Who said, who separated themselves from everything that is under demonic influence for the privilege of sitting at his table. I think it's going to be very difficult for compromisers to be in the same room. Huh? Because when truth begins to shine upon our lives, you know, when truth begins to shine upon our lives in such a context, surely we would be ashamed. But Father doesn't want anybody to be ashamed. 
before him at his coming. He wants every one of us to go through the fire. He wants every one of us to have this faith found unto praise and honor and glory at his appearing. He doesn't want us to have any kind of fear or shame. He wants us to have boldness because as he is in love, we're walking in that same love. As he is, so are we. Think about this. To know and believe the love that God has, God is love. He that dwells in love dwells in God. So some people are talking to me about love and they use love in, you know, in, in the various different arbitrary contexts that they want to apply it. But we're talking about the love that was manifested in God and Christ Jesus. We're talking about the love of His righteousness, the love that's manifested in His holiness, the love that is manifested in His ways, the love that is manifested in His purity, the love that is manifested in the exactness and the severity of that which He commands. Somebody said, oh, well, we can't live that way. Oh, yes, you can. You can learn to live this way. Christ Jesus come and liberated us from the tyranny of, of that which once ruled our life, from the tyrant and the taskmaster who, who, who ruled over our life. Jesus came and liberated us from it. We came under his reign, and he has brought to bear all of the authority of heaven to be aid to us every minute of the day. Then, then sent God from heaven, the Holy Ghost, to be the one who would show us how, to empower us, to inspire us, to give us the, this divine ability. Hallelujah. So what, what? We're without excuse. Why delay? Why delay? Why delay? Why delay any longer? So I said, well, what do I do? First thing is repent. Repent for what? Everything you've been up to this point. <laughs> I should say this again. Somebody said, how do we begin anew? Repent. Repent for what? Everything you've been up to this point. Somebody said, oh, what, are you trying to make me feel bad about myself? No, I'm desperately trying to make you feel better about yourself. I'm trying to make you feel better and be better and live better and have the abundant life that you can only have if you repent about everything that you've been up to this point, about your unwillingness to be readily obedient to his word, your unwillingness to go all the way. I mean, my goodness, it took the disciples three years to get it. Come on. And Jesus is still the same yesterday, today, forever. He's still alive. He took them three years to get it. Somebody said, oh yeah, but he had Jesus with him. But Jesus said, no, 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 no. I got a better plan. It's more expedient for you that I go away because I'm going to send the Holy Ghost because then it's going to expedite it. That means it's faster. It's less than three years. So repent for everything that you've been up to this point. Just start there. Repent for every compromise that you've allowed in your life. Repent for every sin that you've allowed in your life. Somebody said, we don't need to repent. My goodness, it's the only means of forgiveness to repent. Now, I will say this. Repentance does mean change. Repentance means change. And I'm certain that God's plan is that in that repentance that brought the new birth, that brought the change, that turned you from living in the ways of this world under the tyranny of Satan's influence to now be able to be turned now with a new heart and a new spirit to walk with God. It should have been a one-time deal, but let me just say this. If you sin, huh? we have a mediator, we have an advocate, we have, we have a one who is the mercy seat for our sins, and all we have to do is confess them. All we have to do, and listen, if anybody, if anybody sins, they just need to begin to start confessing. We'll pray over them. God will heal you. He'll heal you of your problems. He'll heal you of your sickness and your diseases. I believe there's many people that, that are bound with sicknesses and diseases. It's all because of the sin, unrepented sin in their life, because there should be no sin and sickness, no disease in our life. God, God gave us a radical liberation. He wants to show the majesty and the glory. And somebody says, oh, you mean to tell me that you're not right with God? If you have sickness and disease, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that. 
I'm not saying that. I'm just saying there is, a, there is a place that God has given us to live in Him and we live far beneath that which He has provided for us. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying somebody's got to quit trying to justify their state of being that is so below everything Jesus declared and begin to get radical and lay down their lives so that the majesty and the splendor and the glory of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ may begin to be seen in this earth. And I pray that that person is going to be you. I want to read a couple of verses of Scripture to you, and I'm just going to start in Psalms 110. I'm not going to say much about it. I'm going to talk more about it tonight. But I'm just going to use it as a springboard here. And, I'm, and then I'm going to go back, as it were, almost to the beginning. But Psalms 110, the Lord said, Yehoah said to my Adonai, the Lord said unto my Lord, Yehoah said unto my, Yehoah said unto my Adonai. This is David speaking by the Holy Ghost. Jesus said, Matthew 24, when he was addressing the Pharisees, he said, Jesus spoke. He said, David spoke by the Holy Ghost and said, Yehoah said unto my Adonai. He said, if, if to, you know, remember that? In his, his statement, he said, if David then called him his Lord, his Adonai, then how could he be his son? And they were all quiet after that, right? But Yehoah said unto my Adonai, in other words, the Father said unto the Lord Jesus, who at that time would have been known as the eternal word, amen. Why well, somebody said, why word? He's the definition of God. He's the revelation of God. He's the declaration of God. Hallelujah. He's the proclamation. He's the word. Amen. Hallelujah. He's the one who speaks and it all comes to pass, but he only speaks by the authority of the Father. I mean, it's just an amazing, it is amazing team, the Father the eternal word, Christ Jesus, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. They're an amazing, amazing team. The other day, I, I was with a very a renowned uh, UPC pastor, United Pentecostal Church, and, you know, um, I said to him, yeah, I said, I said what a great movement, you know, uh, that uh, has taken place to United Pentecostal. started with Bartleman. I, was talking, I just went back to Bartleman. I said, you know, and, and I started telling him his history, and he's standing there with his mouth, you know, dropped to the floor and says, wow, you really know my church history very well, because I walked up to the ages to where he's at right now. And I said, you know, the beauty of oneness, the beauty of oneness is so described for us in John chapter 17, verse 21 through 23, isn't it? That just as the Father is in Christ Jesus, Jesus is in us. Isn't that a glorious union and man we had a holy ghost time and fellowship all over oneness hallelujah because there's always a better way to say it you know somebody comes up to you and says hey jesus the prophet say yeah he was an amazing prophet here let me give you this book that describes how great a prophet he was you know he's more of a prophet than you even realize we because i think that we all have too much of a tendency just to argue and get stuck in the rut of religion instead of allowing the beauty and the splendor of this good news to go forth and break off the yoke people i'm going to talk to you militantly i'm going to talk to you radically i'm not talking to the lost here i'm talking to the found who's stuck in a ditch and i'm doing everything i possibly to throw you a rope and say out that ditch right now Here's what you're supposed to do. Rise up and shine. And then if you're going to sit back, if you're going to recoil and say, I can't shine, then I'm going to help you understand that that's because you're faithless. And it's all going to be for the purpose of getting you to a place where you'll rise up and shine, not to beat you down, not to just slander you or just whatever, but to get you to a place of recognizing what God has done for you so you'll rise up, you'll believe what he said, rise up and watch what he will do as he empowers you because you're willing to go instead of make excuses. Making excuses isn't a good thing. Even if it's making excuses about that you need to go bury your dead. No. Let the dead, dead bury the dead. The problem was that the, the, uh, he, he had something he needed to do first. I have nothing. Do you have anything you need to do first before you follow Jesus? But first let me go. But first let me go. But first let me go. Oh, I believe you. Yes, I want to do this. Yes, this is radical. I want to be on the team. But first let me no, the Lord's got to be first. The kingdom of God's got to be first. The purposes of God got to be first. Well, brother, I just worked all of my life and took care of my family. Well, I hope that works out for you. Can't find a verse of scripture really for you, but I hope that works out for you. Well, God is merciful. Yes, he is. He is merciful. And at what point will he divide between that which has been disobedient and that which has been obedient? 
What point? Okay? Let's just give our lives. Listen, if all you want to do is show up to church and be a part of church, then be very good at it. Let me say this again. If all you believe that you should do is show up to church, and I'm talking to people, I'm sure, on the web more than I'm talking to people here. If all you want to do is show up to church, and they're not even show up to church because they're watching on the web. Somebody said to me the other day, my play button on the web wouldn't work. And I said, because you're supposed to be in the meeting. It was no problem with the web. It was broadcasting just fine. If, if you believe that all you need to do to be right with the Lord is to show up to church, then you need to be very, very good at showing up to church. You need to be so full of love, so full of peace, so full of praise, so full of joy, so full of kindness, so full of goodness, so full of generosity huh, and hospitality. You need to be the best church goer on the planet. <laughs> you need to do everything God said was absolutely essential within the framework of church. And then what's going to happen to you is you're going to start reading a little bit more and you're going to find out that the Holy Ghost is divided individually to every person so that each person may have the manifestation of the power of God in their life. And that as you're being a good church goer and a person dedicated to being a best at church, you need to have yourself some supernatural working, whether it's the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, discerning of spirit, the working of miracles, the gift of healing, the gift of faith, whether it's prophecy, tongues, interpretation of tongues, you're going to have to have you something that only the Holy Ghost can operate through you. And by the way, the joy, the peace, the love, the goodness, the truth, all that other, it was just only possible because you was allowing the Holy Ghost to work through you because you can't do it of yourself. You've begun in this miracle salvation by a miracle work of the Spirit of God and you can't finish up on your own. You've got to come to rely upon the power of the Holy Spirit to work in your life to produce all of these things that pertain to the character and the nature of God and it ain't going to be long and you're going to be burdened for a lost and dying world. You're going to be burdened for people who've not seen the light of his goodness, who've never seen the beauty and the splendor of who he is and you're going to get, you're going to get so burdened it's going to take you all the way down to a place on your knees and you're going to cry out to God until the power of the Holy Ghost comes upon you and you become enabled by the Spirit of the Lord to be his witnesses beginning where his glory started in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago when the church was baptized in the Holy Ghost and God's people have been being baptized ever since in the Holy Ghost and fire, the fire of his presence. Baptized. I mean, to wake up in the morning and say, I've, been, I've, I've, stepped, into, I've stepped into heaven. I've stepped into the good news plan of God. I'm immersed, surrounded by the glory of Almighty God. He's not, only, he, he's not only with me, He's in me. But just think about what if it was just He was with me. I mean, that would be a great way to live. I mean, Moses lived good that way. Joshua lived good that way. Caleb lived that good that way. Him just being with them, a cloud by day, a fire, a pillar of fire by night. <laughs> with provision, relying upon them for daily bread every day. The provision. You didn't need to go to the store and buy new shoes. Your shoes didn't tatter or wear. You didn't need to go to the store and buy new clothes. Your clothes stayed just as fine as they were the day you bought them. You were looking good. I don't even think you needed to wash them. The Lord does something good about that too, I'm sure. The Lord, don't, the Lord does, I can tell you, He's not into smelly stuff. The Lord just worked a miracle in the wilderness. Somebody said, how did He get them all in the ark and how did it work? Miracle. How could God be eternal? Miracle. How could there be three? Miracle. Just like you, a miracle. Everything God does is a miracle. Everything, wherever he walks, life springs up. Wherever he, wherever he dwells, there's nothing but life. Creation springs up at just, it, 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 at his breath. The breath of his, of his nostrils. And he's come to live with us and in us to come to know the living reality of the indwelling presence of the Holy Ghost. I'm telling you, relationship is reciprocal. You can't have a relationship with someone who don't talk back to you. You can't have a relationship with someone who don't look back at you. You can't have a relationship with someone who doesn't respond to you. I'm telling you, the Lord has made a way so you and I can have a relationship. We ask, He answers. He ordained and called us to be this way to whatever we ask him, he'll do it. 
You cannot get away from the truth of the Word of God. I'm not, I know it's so familiar for people to be listening to uh, Christian philosophy rather than the Word of God. But I'm going to tell you right now, you might as well go ahead and get an appetite change. You might as well go ahead and get conditioned to eat different kind of food. Amen. You'll like this food better. Hallelujah. Praise God. In the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. It's better food. Praise the name of the Lord Jesus. Even fish. If they've been raised on a bad diet, you change their diet, give them better food, they won't go back. They'll stop, they'll stop eating. We're waiting for that good food. Where's that good food at? We were raised on that bad food, but now we've got a new palate. Even fish. How much more? Those of us who've been born of the Spirit and have the discerning of the Holy Ghost in our life. We know the Word. We know the Word. The Word of God springs up on the inside of us. Did not our hearts burn within us? You can't come here and not say your heart didn't burn within you. You might have got upset about it. And you might have gotten mad about it. But I'm telling you right now, won't let, He won't let you go. He ain't going to let you go. And, and a lot of people begin upset and mad about it is because it's demanding change and people don't like to change. They get comfortable. They talk themselves into uh, being right with their wrong. You're never going to make right wrong or wrong right. It is what it is by nature. It's amazing to me how many people in the secular community can recognize that alcohol is bad and now people in the Christian community has now made alcohol good whacked out. Somebody said, would you please give us a, a theological dissertation on the, the, the use of alcohol? I just simply said this. Here, here I'm going to do this for you. Are you ready? You can't take something bad, something bad and make it good. You can't take something wrong and make it right. I'm done. But, 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 whatever. You need to get that engine fixed. <laughs> You can't take something. You just, it's just that simple. People quit justifying stuff. Huh? Think about it, people. 70 years ago, 70 years ago, the secular community had an uprising because there was a movie made called Gone with the Wind. Gone with the Wind had one word in it, damn. The secular community, was, there was an uproar in the secular community. Today, the church, the degradation of morality is a church. It participates with far worse things and has justified it. Huh? It's the frog effect in boiling water. You know what I'm saying? Huh? You just start off heating it up slow and the frog is just happy sitting there doing, you know, ribbit, ribbit, and bores himself to death because he anesthetizes to his environment that ultimately destroys him. You can justify anything. The Word of God is a light unto your path. The Word of God will be a bright encounter of the will of the Father shining in your face by Jesus Christ. It's time for us to conform to the image of the Son. That means to do what He did, act like He acts, to be what He's called us to be. Come on now. Come on now. You can't be a sinner and a saint. Choose which one you're going to be. Start confessing it over you and start prophesying it over you. You can't be a devil and a son of God. I mean, you can't be a devil, a son of Satan and a son of God. Decide what you're going to be. You can't commune with evil spirits and be full of the Holy Spirit. Decide what you're going to be. All I'm laying out are parallels that Paul laid out, that Jesus laid out. You can't be an evil uh, tree and, and a good tree at the same time. You can't bear forth evil fruit and good fruit at the same time. Decide which one you're going to be. You can't be a fountain of bitter water and sweet water. You've got to be one or the other. Decide which one you're going to be. I'm going to be a good tree with sweet water bearing forth good fruit. I'm going to be a saint in light, a son of the living God, communing with the Holy Ghost, tealed up with the Spirit of God. And then I'm going to learn to discipline that I'm not going to allow things to come out of my mouth that are not pleasing unto Him. I'm not going to allow because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. I'm going, to, I'm going to be dedicated to every time that I fail, I will resolve myself to succeed. Huh? rather than to lay in the, in the quagmire of defeat. That's a big difference between a sheep and a pig. Huh? If a pig, you clean a pig up, it falls down in the muck, it's going to roll around and stay there. A sheep's going to get up and, and going to go get out in the field again and going to get cleaned up, at least if no, no other, by no other means, the rainwater. Listen to me. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, 
You got a, God gave you a clean spirit, not an unclean spirit. He gave you a Holy Spirit, not an evil spirit. He gave you the spirit of holiness. People say, yes, I have the Holy Spirit. That means you have the spirit of holiness. <laughs> My dear friend was just here this past week. I, I haven't seen him since I was 10 years old, but I, his family and our family have been close for many years. And, and I didn't introduce him as Dr. Tim Allen. He's, he's Dr. Tim Allen. He got his Ph.D. from Cambridge University. And I said, do you want me to introduce you that way? He goes, no, man, I don't want you to introduce me like that. I think that people need to be introduced as doctors, those folks who are kind of feeling insecure about it. But nonetheless, I'm not going to talk about that. That's not my subject. <laughs> okay. And, you know, he would just, you know, he was really, you know, emphasizing some very important things on Wednesday night that people need to grab a hold of. And I know that you had to kind of look, listen through the jargon of social science. But nonetheless, I mean, come on, dear people. Father's going to speak to you in, in many different ways on every, on every level he possibly can speak to get somebody to wake up, to listen up. Let me, I was going to go into something, but I'm not going to do it right now. Let me just, let me read this to you. I, I, I run out of time before I get started. to my problem. Jehovah said unto my Adonai, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies my footstool. I want you to understand that that ministry began after Jesus ascended up on high. I want you to understand that that ministry began. I'm going to begin to unfold this, how that his enemies, the heavens had to receive him. Acts chapter 3, verse 21, the heavens had to receive him until the time of the restoration of all things. Jesus, when he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, he poured out the power of the Holy Spirit upon his vessel, his scepter of righteousness, his church, to go everywhere administrating his lordship, his kingship, the will of the Father in all the world, to go and conquer and subdue, to make disciples out of every nation, to have authority over all the powers of darkness, to have all the strength of the Lord and the power of his might, to have the whole armor of God, to be able to deal with effectively every trick of Satan, be, to recognize that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness in high places, and to be at every point able to totally throw them down with his divine authority. We can't abdicate and say we're right. Huh? But what we can do is if we have abdicated in any way is we can repent. We can say, Father, I don't want to live this way anymore. I'm willing to boldly step into the authority that you've given when you gave to us the ability to tread upon scorpions and serpents and over all the power of the enemy so that nothing by, nothing, no evil thing, no power of Satan can by any means hurt us or harm us. To think about the authority and to recognize that we live far beneath our authority. And in that, you're going to have all kinds of problems hearing God, walking and moving in faith, living out a practical living reality of the power of God through your life. You can't compromise this. Somebody said, Pastor, are you telling me that I need to quit my job? No, I'm not. I'm telling you, you need to sanctify your job. You know, it just keeps coming back to me, so I'm going to say it. Tim went to uh, Southwestern. You know, he's, his, dad is, his dad is one of the close friends of Dake. Tim lived with Dake for three years. Um, you know, the whole, it's a circle. It's family. His dad and my dad were on the streets when they were 20 years old, preaching the gospel of signs and wonders and miracles. They got pictures of them being blown off the streets, watered down by the fire department in Atlanta, Georgia. Just all kinds of great things that's happened in life. So he's got a great background, but nonetheless, he was hungry to be more established in the Word, so he went to Southwestern. And he you know, wanted to emphasize, have an emphasis in biblical studies, but also do social sciences there. And, you know, he's just always had a problem with religion and the couple of women were in front of him and, um, you know, they were having some meetings and, and there's this couple of, of holy women standing in front of him in a meeting and they started talking about these two girls who responded to the altar call who went down with pants on. And they were, the two women were saying, I can't believe those women are so disrespectful. They went down there with pants. And so Tim's behind him and started saying, Lord, take those pants off of them right now. Take those pants off of them right now. And so the women got really upset at him. And this so happened to be the president's wife and the dean's wife. And he wasn't really, he didn't really know that. 
And so he goes in and he's being, he's, he's being given, the, he's being, give, being read the riot act. And he said, okay, 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 okay. I came in here and I signed a piece of paper that said I would not go to movies. But I'm going to tell you right now, your saints are sitting in those rooms watching on television things that I would never watch at a movie. And all I've been is raised as a Southern Baptist boy. But you, you guys got your sanctification and that you don't go to the movie theater, but it's okay for you to get your videotape out, plug it in, and it is absolute iniquity. And he went down the list, list of this holiness movement. And the guys were sitting there crying when it was all done. Because it's so amazing the things that people justify that it has, makes no sense, there's no rhyme or reason to the justification. We can, every one of us, have to be willing to start listening to the spirit of holiness and say, Holy Spirit, what do you feel about this? I guarantee you, if you open up the Word of God and you say, Holy Spirit, what do you feel about this? He's going to begin to give you some instruction. How is it that you and I are going to be able to go and conquer and subdue Satan at every point when we somehow have been snared by his trap? We're chasing after him with his snare on our foot. And the chain's got a certain amount of length. And we go running after him in Jesus' name and plop, we fall down because we, we, we stuck. We just snared. We snared. We just try to come with the voice of the word of the Lord against him. And we find a threshold where we can't go forward. Somebody said, how can, that's probably true. How do I get out of it? Repent. Repent for everything that you've done and let God begin to just, just redefine things anew for you. Don't hold on to the past. Don't hold on to the past. Even if you've done great things in God, don't hold on to the past. Don't say, oh, well, I, I've been, I did. What? So you're a has-been. Repent for being happy about being a has-been. Huh? And come on now. And cry out to God, say, Lord, use me more. Use me more. Use me more. Huh? It is illegal in Southern California to talk about the waves that you rode yesterday kind of thing, you know, or whatever else it is that you did yesterday or last year or what it was you did whenever. Hey, come on, give me a break. What are you doing now? What's happening now? What's going on right now? Where, where is the hunger and the thirst after righteousness? At? Where is the evidence or the fruit of the Holy Ghost compelling your emotions and your appetites? That's what's important. Not what happened last year. 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And you know what? This isn't going to work. This isn't going to work when you stand before the Lord. Lord, I was doing well, and Pastor Mark upset me. <laughs> it ain't going to do nothing. It ain't gonna, he's not gonna, that isn't going to be a defense. If he, he, you know, what you're saying was right, but he needed to say it in a different way. And if he would have just said it in a different way, I would have done it. That isn't going to work with the Lord. Oh, it's not going to work with them. You're going to have to rise up now. In Jesus' name. Boy, you, could, you should hear how I really want to say that. I want to feel the atmosphere with a shout that I bust your eardrum. In Jesus' name. This change. And I'm also scared you. Hallelujah. The Lord shall send. Listen to this. Because verse 2 really talks about this baptism in the Holy Ghost. The Lord will send the rod of his strength out of Zion. He did. He did. Go tarry in Jerusalem. Now, we know that Zion is the church. Not Jerusalem. But there is a, there is a certain amount of overlap, if you would. There's a certain amount of symbolism in the, na in the living, literal Jerusalem with Zion. But we know what Paul said in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22. He says, we've come unto Zion. We're right now in the city of the living God. We're, we're, we're right now in the, in the heavenly uh, Jerusalem. Right at this very moment. To think about that, to contemplate that, listen, to believe it. You have to redefine your life now. To believe this, you have to redefine your life. No, I'm going to, nah, I'm not going to sit there and let you just process this and say, oh, this is very interesting. Uh-uh. No, 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 you have to redefine your life now. You have to redefine your life. If you, as a part of the church, 
are the enforcement of His will, the one to go make disciples out of nations, the one to go subdue and conquer, the one to go and preach the good news, to proclaim. I mean, just think about Paul's acceptance of this call to go and proclaim the good news and look at what his, the results that one man had in his generation. Look at the results that one man had in his generation. You're no different. I'm no different. The only thing that makes a difference between him and you or him and me is how willing we are to go all the way with God. And you talk about the press, and you talk about persecution, and you talk about the forces of hell going to stop you. That's why he said, I fought with the beast at Ephesus. I was delivered out of, the, out of the lion's mouth. That's just on the spiritual terms. And then all the opposition that he had, everywhere that he went, he's being persecuted. He's being run off the place. He's been beaten with stripes. He's been stoned. I mean, everywhere you go, Satan comes out against you to stop you. But God's made us more than conquerors. And people sitting around saying, I'm more than conquer because they paid their bills. Let's, let's get the, come on, let's raise the bar a little bit, you know. Let's have a bit more of a threshold here than it being all about self-interest. Oh, I'm more than a conqueror. I lived a whole day without lusting. Give me a break. People, there's, if you would just get busy with the kingdom of God, you wouldn't have to deal with all that mess anyways. You just idle. It's the devil's workshop. Get busy. Start running. Be a person with a, that looks like that one described by Joel who's got a face like a lion. So when I say, when you start talking, sometimes you look mad. I don't think I look mad. I might look a little angry, but mad. I'm in my right mind. Passionate. Passionate. And, 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 and when Satan is trying to stop things, I mean, when you get, look, you, when you are really, if you could see what I'm seeing, you would have a little bit of a terrified look on your face too. You know what I'm saying? Look, we need to engage and understand the, the, the call of God upon our life and understand our opportunity and our privilege. I mean, our life is just, it's, it's going by very quickly. It's going by, it's fleeting. If you'll get down on your face and begin to cry out to God, if you get purposeful with the Lord, and you'll set the bar on the level of doing everything that Jesus said to do, being everything that Jesus said to be, to walk in that divine power, I give you power to testify that I am King of kings and Lord of lords. I give you power to testify that I'm at the right hand of the Father now with absolute authority in heaven and earth. Come on. I give you power because we just want to, we want to kind of define it on, in terms of those things that we're familiar, power to be witnesses. Well, exactly what does that mean? I'll give you power to go everywhere and tell people that I am the risen Lord and God. And here's what the power is going to look like when you do these things. I'm going to give you the ability to turn men from the power of Satan to God so that San Diego, three million people won't be blinded by the God of this world. I'm going to give you the ability to open up their eyes. Wow. I was with my, my new friend, Pat, Pat uh, Schutzline. And uh, a couple of other guys and just talking about, hey, the Lord is going to do something through the multiplicity of ministry, through the, through the, through the activation and the momentum of the church as a whole. And I said, yeah, my dear friends, I hear you, I hear you. I Man, I believe that too. But reality of it is, is God's only ever been able to find one or two. Everybody else is sitting complaining about something or other. Everybody else has got some kind of a problem of why they can't go forward. They're thrusting one against another. Where's Joel's army? But the Lord says in verse 3, his people will be willing in the day of his power. His people. This is the day of his power. It's not a day to come. It is the day of his power. He has poured forth the, the Holy Ghost. He's given us power. He has all power. In the name of Jesus, everything must obey. Devils must go. Blind eyes must open. You know, you even got an example of a person in Jesus' day that wasn't walking with Jesus, wasn't following Jesus in the sense of being with the disciples. And, the, and John stumbles up on them one day and, and he finds this guy and he's casting out devils in the name of Jesus. 
and, he's, and, he, and, and, he, and he forbade him. And Jesus said, no, 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 don't forbid him. Here's a guy that just basically wasn't even, as it were, qualified in the sense that he wasn't called by the Lord Jesus to come and follow him, but he's willing to believe and, and, and reproduce what he saw take place as he watched the disciples do this, and so he did it himself. These things aren't hard to do. It's just that you can't have a dual identity and do them. You can't have a bunch of doubt and unbelief working in your heart and move forward in them. You can't live under the subjugation to Satan who wants no light shining, no light of the gospel of the truth shining, and be able to be effective. Because as soon as a little bit of anointing comes on you, the enemy's going to do everything he can possibly do to get that off you. As soon as a little bit of light of God's glory begins to shine through you, Satan's going to do everything he possibly can do to shut it down. Dear people, we are on the threshold right now of one of God's blessed, wonderful, sovereign moves, a time of refreshing, a harbinger of the restoration of all things, of his coming. He's, it's as though, as I was saying early on, it's like every time he steps one step closer to the earth, we have a radical encounter with his presence. One step closer, radical encounter with his presence, because he's coming to get us. He's coming to take, he's come to take hold of his church. And though we are seated with him by authority in a heavenly realm right now, we're seated with him. Jesus, God, Jehovah said to my Adonai, sit here at my right hand until I make your enemies my footstool. And the heavens must receive him, Acts 3.21, until the restoration of all things. And him being exalted by the right hand of the Father has poured forth that which you both see and hear, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Right? Acts chapter 2, verse 20, what is it, 34. You with me? You hear the, you, can you hear the connections? Can you hear the connections? of how that his rod, his scepter, how that his authority, how his strength has gone forth out of Zion, has gone forth out of the realm that the church now exists in. And if you take it literally, Jerusalem, how it all began there on the day of Pentecost and nothing has changed, it's con that fire continues to burn bright. I wanna close with just a couple of verses of scripture then I'll come back to this tonight and make hopefully speak in such a way of clarity by the help and the grace of God that you won't be intrigued intellectually, but you'll be so moved with divine passion that you decide, I'm going to do this. Your emotions get into this. Your passions get into this. The force of your will gets into this. This is who I'm going to be. You fall down upon your face and you consecrate yourself. What does consecration mean? It, it means to purposefully give yourself to live like Jesus to purposefully give yourself to live in the realms of heaven. That's what sanctification is all about. You've been set apart to live this heavenly life. And you consecrate yourself to those things, and you begin to pursue them in prayer. You begin to pursue them in your relationship with the Lord. I'm going to tell you why. It won't be long. Even if it were, even if it were, and it doesn't need to be this, and I'm not saying I'm not going to limit to this, even if it were that you gave your whole life seeking the Lord to be used on this level, and you had one day to be able to reach a nation. My goodness. What glory, what honor. But Father's going to do far more with you because this is the day of His sovereign move. Every just looking for anybody who's willing. Anybody who's willing. Anybody who... And He's going to examine you. He's going to examine you because there's going to be many days that you can decide he's going to be second and you're just going to stay at home today because, you're, because, because you don't feel good or things aren't working out or you're just not going to go forward in God because of this thing and that thing and the other thing and you can't go do what God told you to do because you're afraid and you're just not that way and you're just, and I'm just not outgoing. Who cares about what you are in that sense, right? Because it's not by might, not by power. You're dependent upon the wrong thing. So you've got to get that sorted out before you can even go. Because he said, you can't be my witnesses until the, it's about the Holy Ghost now. It's not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Until it's the movings of God in your life. Until where the, until where the fire of God takes over your life. You're not even self-conscious anymore. It's not about you doing your will. And you're being moved by your own self-interest. And now doing the will of the Father. And moved by the force. Force. The force. <laughs> force of a rushing mighty wind and a fire that burns and consumes everything. There will be a great miracle day coming 
in the not too distant future where the church will rise up as the army of God that Jewel described. And it's been this way at different times. There's been, there's been moments of it, okay? It's just, there's been revivals. There's been awakenings where the church rose up like a Joel's army and everybody was united for one single cause and a fire of God burned before them and it was, and, and, and it was though it was, it was like a garden of Eden and the fire burned and, 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 and brought in such a harvest that there was nothing left behind them, not even the gleaning. It became what we call a mincha offering unto the Lord, which is a whole burnt offering, but it's a bread of fruit. It's going to happen again. And it's going to happen in the midst of perilous times. And it's going to happen in the midst of a great confusion and desperation. The United States of America was at a crossroads and it chose the wrong way. Today, we're not standing in a place of coming under judgment. We're, coming, we're standing in a place of eating the fruits of our doings. Because if you sow to the flesh, you shall reap a, wind, a whirlwind of destruction. And a nation that's consecrated and vowed itself to the Lord and enjoyed its prosperity and blessing from the same to then turn against Him and deny Him and to blaspheme and that, that holy name by which they were blessed and to bring reproach against the name of His only begotten Son, God will show forth His mercy by taking all the blessing away so people can sober up for a minute. Say, wait a minute, where did this blessing come from? Putin's picking a fight. He's a wild, crazy KGB guy. He's got nuclear subs sitting right there in international waters. And they were just spotted coming into our territorial waters two months ago. He wants, he just want, he wants NATO to do anything. Just try it. I'll start firing on you. He's ready. Israel's, uh, Israel is being very burdened right now with what's going on in Iran and what's going on with, with not only um, what's going on with, with, with Gaza and, and Syria, Hamas and, 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 and the other and new, new organizations that are just... coming up in northern, Iraq, in northern Iraq. ISIS and these other organizations. Nuclear power in Iran. The hatred, the anti-Semitism. There's a great revival of anti-Semitism in Turkey. It's just all shaping. It's all shaping that Assyria would join to Turkey and Greece and Egypt. All, all shaping up for Satan's day of and moment of an attempt to try to overthrow God, he really believes he can do it. He, he doesn't believe that you're redeemed. He's rebellious, he's stubborn, he's a liar. He doesn't believe that, you, that you're, you're going to make it. He's always challenged God. There's no one down there serving you. They're following me. Come on now, let's, let's see some champions come out to this. Come on now. Come on now. Let's see some people sacrifice their life instead of preserve it. Come on now. Come on. Say, look, you know, whether I live or whether I die, we're going to obey God here. No matter what it costs me, I'm going to risk it all to be a part of God's salvation at this moment in time. Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and the United States of America is not going to be left out. And the fact of it is, as we approach the day into time, it's like a woman in travail with birth pains. Yeah, we can say, well, there's been, there's been wars and rumors of war. There's been kingdom against kingdom, nation against nation. There's been earthquakes. There's been problems. There's been great devastation, great disaster over the past 2,000 years. Yeah, but it's going to come with greater frequency. Just like a person getting ready to have a baby. Those birth pains get closer and closer together. Somebody's going to have, have enough oil. Enough anointing, enough power of God to make it through the night hour. Because the night is coming. You listen to me. You listen to me. People, I'm going to tell you something. If you haven't learned how to serve God, I want you to know. You have not enough will to make it through the night hour. You do not have enough. You listen to me. 
you've not gotten your found your feet in stability in Christ Jesus, I tell you, you have a witness that you have not enough oil to make it through the night hour. The night is coming. And the compromises that you've made on a little level and the things that you've been able to convince yourself in small ways and justify yourself because it's convenient for you, it will have greater pressure on you in that moment and that time and that night hour. You do what you need to survive and live. Come on now, listen to me. You won't know how to take hold of the relationship with God when Satan has such influence. But in the midst of that night hour, there's going to be a great revelation and a moving in the power of God. I just see it. I see it there with I see it there when Paul and Silas was in prison and they began to worship God and praise God at the midnight hour. And a great miracle took place and the change taken off of them. The prison door was open. The gospel went forth. Philippi, Macedonia began to be shaken and changed by the power of God that night. The empire of the world. But that day, the time, second in line at any rate. Let me just finish here with Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, and just kind of set this up a little bit. I hope you come back tonight. I hope you come back tonight to not hear me preach, not so there's more people in the building, but so that you seek God, so that you'll hear from heaven, you'll be stirred by the Spirit of the Lord. If you, if you don't come here and get stirred, then there's, there's, simp there's, simply, there's simply no reason for you to come. But I guarantee you, you come here, you're going to be stirred by the Spirit of the Lord and by the Word of the Lord. So that you can begin to lay hold on God. Because God's given it all as a gift, but it's not cheap. It's all free, but you've got to hunger and thirst to have it. Because it's sacred. God veils His glory in the mystery. He does. He veils His glory in the mystery because it's sacred. There's always mysterious things around His glory. But you're going to have to ask a whole bunch of questions, and you're going to have to be willing to go through the process to say, oh, the spirit of wisdom and revelation hits you so that your eyes of your understanding are open so that you can understand the exceeding greatness of His power that was given you when He raised Jesus from the dead and exalted Him in His own right hand and said, sit here till I make your enemies your footstool. Now, I know people accuse me of... of, of Bring, splicing scriptures together, but I do so for the point. I know that's not an. I know I just didn't quote Ephesians 1:20 correctly right now. I know I added in something, but I added in so you can understand what's being said. As you know, might know the exceeding greatness of His power that was given to us when He raised Christ Jesus from the dead and set Him at His own right hand. Period. Saying, "Sit here until I make your enemies your footstool." to understand the exceeding greatness of His power that was given to me, that was given to you. I think we read past it too quick. It's like I quoted it, right? <laughs> to understand the exceeding greatness of divine authority that was given to you to go make disciples out of nations. To understand the exceeding greatness of His power that was given to you so that you may be strong in the strength of the Lord and the power of His might so that you may be able to throw down Satan at every point that you meet him because Jesus was manifested and is continued to be manifested to destroy the works of the devil. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. And when he sat down at the right hand of the, and being exalted at the right hand of the Father, Jesus said, If any man thirst, let him come to me, I'll give him to drink, and out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water, the spake he of the Holy Ghost, which was not yet given for you, was not yet glorified. Jesus now being glorified in heaven, and seated at the right hand of the Father, has poured forth that which you both see in here. The first witness of an unlimited power and authority, unrestrained ability to express every dimension of the glory and power and majesty of Jesus Christ. That's radical stuff, isn't it? Who believes this? Who believes this? Somebody said, why do you do that? I hook up with the Holy Ghost doing it. Takes me to a place where I now begin to excel to begin to do other things in the Holy Ghost as well. 
Uh, it's the first expression that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father and executing divine authority over all the earth. Jesus now being raised up and exalted at the right hand of the Father has poured forth that which you see and hear. See and hear. Thus it's the ascension gift. Thus it's the authoritative power, right hand ministry, ruling and reigning majesty of the living God that his strength has gone forth out of Zion. I believe this. I want you to believe this. Because faith is going to first be activated because you're willing to hear the Word of God and believe it. And then once you believe it, then you have to act on it. And as you be willing to act on it, that's, the, that's where the Holy Ghost supplies to us faith, which is a supernatural power and ability on the scale that it will tell mountains to be cast in the sea, sycamine trees to be plucked up by the roots and planted in the water. And everything that you say will happen because God chose you and ordained you and elected you that whatsoever you ask the Father, He would do it. He would do it. He would do it. He would do it. Somebody said, well, I tried it. Well, you're just, you're learning how to turn the engine on. That's all. Well, I tried it and it didn't work. You're learning how to move in faith. Don't give up. Don't make your experience, exalt your experience above the Word of God because nothing, nothing, no power can change the Word of God. It's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for every word, than for, than for the words of Christ Jesus not to be fulfilled because every word of Jesus will be fulfilled. And these works which I do shall you do greater works than these, says the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I was sitting down at the table the other day with one of my friends, and his face started shining. I'm telling you, babe, she was shining. I act like nothing was happening. I mean, I felt the power God. Because he didn't know what was going on. He was just sitting there, he was just sitting there talking about the Lord. The overshadowing of the glory of God. On the, on the brightness of God. I'm not imagining, I'm not exaggerating, I'm not imagining something. I'm telling you what's happening. Some days later, I said, hey, Bo, did you know your face was shining? He said, it happened to me before. Somebody said, how do you say that? Stay there, preaching every night, praying every day. Hmm? Going everywhere, declaring, doing my job, declaring that Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords and now rules in heaven and having all authority in heaven and in earth and everything must obey his word for he, 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 is, he is exalted above all principality and power and might and dominion because that's the rest of Ephesians chapter 1 that I was quoting the eyes of your understanding see we want the spirit of wisdom revelation so that you can see the exceeding greatness of his power that was given to you when he raised Jesus Christ from the dead set him his own right hand poured out the Holy Ghost upon you and given to, and set him far above all principalities and powers and might and dominion and it set him to be the head over the church his dream is going out of Zion. Zion is his church. Hallelujah. Everywhere his, everywhere his church is, there is Zion. He's standing in the midst of his church. That's where Jesus is right now, standing in the midst of his seven golden candlesticks, which are his church. Hallelujah. Right now he has his ministers that he has anointed as apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers in his right hand. Hallelujah. As one dear brother said, it wasn't that, it wasn't that, there was abuses in the, in, in, the, in, in the priestly ministry of God. It's just that there was a rebellious move to do away with the laity. So now we've got a bunch of chiefs and no followers. Oh, God, help us. The revival again. Turn it back around. He will. God, in his right hand is our apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And I'm telling you, they got something to say for you that you need to hear if you're going to be able to be complete. If you're going to be able to be hooked up, I'm telling you right now, you can't run from place to place and think that you're going to be right with God. Huh? You can't flee from his presence. You can't flee from his presence because the Lord has been interceding for you and a big well's going to come and swallow you up until you repent. Amen. Amen. I put that on you right now in Jesus' name. The word's gone forth and it's got to it's happen. <laughs> There's no escape in the presence of the Lord. <laughs> you know, the beautiful thing is, is that we, while we preach the word, here's what happens while we preach the word. Same thing that happened at Cornelius' house happens while we preach the word. Even while he was yet spake, the Holy Ghost came upon them. 
And when we see it over and again, that people who don't resist God, but who are hungry, who are willing to receive, who are not willing to come under the con... If you listen to Satan, you're going to listen to him all the time. Don't listen to him at any time. His primary work is imagination. God's giving you God power, strength to cast down his imagination so that they can't mess with you, so that you can learn to hear and see and understand the things of the Spirit of the Lord. Hallelujah. And as the word of the Lord comes forth, I mean, the thing that Cornelius had, the advantage that Cornelius had, is that he knew that he had the right preacher talking to him. And he, you know, he knew he was of God because an angel of the Lord came and said, Sin for Peter. He's in Joppa at Simon Tanner's house. Hallelujah. He knew that when he go in, that he knew that he had the right preacher with the right message. I mean, that right there will help you uh, to be able to open up your heart and begin to receive from God because as he yet spake, the Holy Ghost fell on them as he fell on uh, the, 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 the 120 at, for, at the first. The same thing happens here. Whether you're sick in your body, hurting, tormented, doesn't matter what it is. Whether you need strength to increase in the anointing, all you got to do is be hungry and thirsty and you're going to get filled up. For a table is... For a table is set. And the master calls you, come and dine. For the banquet is here, the feast is here. Communion has already been being served. We've already been handing out his flesh, uh, which is meat indeed, and his blood, which is drink indeed. We've already been. We've already been supplying, hallelujah, the bread of life, the bread of heaven, hallelujah. We've already been supplying this holy cup of communion, zizaponka and fellowship. All you have to do is partake. Your affinity to your things will keep you from partaking. God won't mix it. You have to repent and let it go. Your affinity, if you cleave to anything, Father's not going to receive a sacrifice that is not a whole burnt offering that is set completely apart for Him. It can't be, I surrender half. I surrender half. Half to you, Lord. Half to me. I surrender half. It can't be that. It's truly got to be a consecrated call. I surrender all. All to you, Lord. My Redeemer. He looks and He sees an offering that's holy and acceptable. And when He sees an offering holy and acceptable, one that is perfect, one that is according to that which he described that you should bring, then fire comes from heaven as a witness that it is acceptable. It's an acceptable offering. There's too many people saying that the fire burns to burn up all the problems. No! It burns as a witness that it's holy and acceptable unto God. And as long as you walk with God in obedience, the fire of God will burn in your life. And when the fire of God's burning in your life, you can't be lukewarm. And satisfied with earthly things and sensual things. Hallelujah. Then you find yourself clean, escape from all that mess and take your place with Him, seated together with Him in the heavenly realm, executing divine authority. You're going to rule and reign with Him for a thousand years and soon, and soon to come. You might as well learn practice now. Might as well practice now. Might as well practice now. You're going to crush the head of anybody who sins. You're going to crush the head and rule with a rod of iron and smash them. As a potter would smash a marred vessel that he formed. You might as well learn right now. Oh, humanism will find no place in that realm. Because he will rule with a rod of iron until he crushes all his enemies. That's the thousand years to come. It's time for you to do some smashing now. Smashing the stuff that would try to take hold of you smashing the stuff around you that would try to impose Satan's will upon your life and stop you from doing what God's called you to go and do. Just rise up boldly and go and do it. Amen. And if you get thrown in prison, praise God. If you get killed, praise God. If you shine brighter, praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Supravadabate. Whatever you do, serve the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul with all your mind, with all your strength, with all your everything. Whatever you do, love Him. Love Him enough to obey Him, for His kingdom is a kingdom that is ruled by relationship. If you love me, you'll obey me. That's His kingdom. Love Him. Let God fill you up with His love. Arriba Satori Piyasa. You know, let me tell you this. In closing, let me tell you this. All your problems are from something you're hanging on to and will not let go. 
all your frustration, all your sadness, all your fight, all your trip up, all your sin, all your problems is an indication, it is a evidence, it is a manifestation of something that you're hanging on to and will not surrender to God and let go. And it is not necessarily obvious you're going to have to let the floodlight of heaven shine upon your soul because you are willing. See, in the day of his power, his people shall offer a free will offering. They will be a minka. Literally, it says, in the day of his power, his people shall offer a free will offering. Not just in the day of his power, his people shall be willing. Free will offering. I give myself to you, Lord. Holy and acceptable. How did I get holy and acceptable? Jesus made me that. It's a gift. Now I consecrate myself to live this life that you have defined, that you have designed, that you have freely given. Come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, we engaged in a heated battle, but we're having a great time doing it. We are. The Lord's made us veterans of war. I believe all of da I believe all David's mighty men had a wonderful time. It's like you know, he was bored, didn't have anything to do, so you know, basically, he took on a lion-like man with no weapon. I'll take his weapon away from him and kill him with it. Ah, <sighs> what next? Because he was an enemy of God's plan, an enemy of God's kingdom, an enemy of, God, an enemy of God's purposes trying to stand, prevent the, what Father is, was manifesting in terms of his kingdom in that day. Tonight I'm going to minister a little bit on this. I'm going to just give you a little commercial, commercial break. Joshua, man, he stood up. Whew. He stood up in such power to command the, month, the sun and the moon. Don't you move in Agilon. Stay right there in Gibeon. Wow, what authority with God, eh? just because he was willing to go all the way for 40 years. I've been going to this church for 40 years. <laughs> he didn't say that. He didn't say that. He didn't say it like that. I've been in this church for 40 years, man. Something's going to happen. Something's going to happen. Something's going to happen. And he not only was in the church, he wouldn't move. Scripture said he, once he saw the glory, he did not depart from the door of the temple. He made his camp right there. The Lord said, I'm moving my tent outside of Israel because they do not want me to dwell in his midst. They're midst. Joshua didn't ask permission. He grabbed his tent and he <laughs> set it up right by the tent of the Lord. And he wasn't of the right tribe to be that close. But there's something about the heart and the passion that God will not refuse. That's right. That's right. He won't refuse it. He conquered five great kings. Joshua conquered five, great, five of the greatest kings of his day, greatest empires of his day. What he does is he throws them in a cave. He's got a plan. He says, go round up all the captains. Go round up anybody who's a leader. Bring them here. He drags those five kings out of the cave. He says, all of you come by here. Put your foot on their throat. Put your foot on their throat. Put your foot on the throat. Now be strong and very courageous, for God shall subdue through you everything that rises up against you. Come on now. Come on now. Come on now. Somebody's going to have to stand up and be counted as those are people of faith who aren't turned back by the slight, uh, slightest little wind or the slightest little bit of opposition or criticism. Huh? You, know what makes a, you know what makes a warrior? so valiant on the battlefield, he's resigned himself to die. It's not that he doesn't have fear like everybody else, he just resigned himself to die. He's given his life. He didn't halfway, he was not half measures of participating with a cause. He resigned himself to die for this purpose. Come on now. Come on now. You're going to have to lose your life if you want to get into this. You want to get in this? You're going to have to lose your life. You're going to have to then, after having lost your life, you're going to have to go ahead and deny yourself every day. Hallelujah. And it's good. The reward is good. You were born into the kingdom. You were born into the kingdom for such a time as this to rule and reign with Jesus. Every one of you. 
I'm not, not, don't live any longer as a beggar and a slave. I'm going to say this in closing. I'm not going to get to my Hebrews 1.3. But I'm going to say this in closing. God made an opportunity for all Israel to hear His voice and to represent Him as, as, as each one on an even on an even plane, not promoting Moses above them, but said, set all of them before me and let them hear my word. And what they said was this. They behaved themselves not, behaved themselves not valiantly, not as those who have been set as priests before the Lord and kings before the Lord, but they behaved themselves as the slaves that they were taught to be. And said to Moses, you go listen to him, then come back and tell us what to do. Listen to me. Listen to me. People are very comfortable just being told what to do instead of being empowered. Just here, here's your little job. Just shut up and do it. Huh? And be, you know, be comfortable making bricks or sloshing around in the mud of Goshen. Are you with me? Do you hear me? Hear me? He doesn't call us servants anymore, but co laborers. You hear me? He doesn't call us servants anymore, but heirs. That's pretty radical. He doesn't, we're not children anymore, but sons. That's what, child differs nothing more than a servant, even though he's Lord of all. But God hasn't made us, we're not children anymore, held under tutors. God has promoted anyone who's being willing to hear to sonship. And that's sonship, Galatians 4, 7. I want you to stand with me. I just want to say this to you. I want to say this, dear people, you must listen to me. The first rule, the first law of the Spirit. Can I say the first law of the Spirit? How, why, don't I just say, why don't I say, why don't I say Romans 8, 2 like this? That the spiritual laws of life, because people are violating spiritual laws all the time, and you need to learn spiritual laws. They're more important than learning natural laws. And there's more to be discovered in knowing and understanding spiritual laws than Isaac Newton or Einstein or anyone else ever discovered studying physical laws of the universe. I was so blessed when a friend of, who knows Stephen Hawking told me that Stephen Hawking said, has tried to put in his last book, this was designed by a creator. His, uh, his, his editors would not let him put it in there. And they said, they had to, they said no, you, you had to say, this was designed and held together by gravity. Because there's nobody going to study the, the natural laws of life too long. Because he's from Cambridge. And, uh, you know, I know some folks from Cambridge. You're not going to study natural laws too long. And, and then you're going to discover great insights. And, and you're going to discover great things to do, things that will move us beyond the limitations. Discovering these things allowed us to go and, and to outer space and do the things we've done and walk on the moon and all the other stuff that we've done. And ultimately, you'll see and discover the, discover the designer behind it all. Well, what if you study spiritual laws? There is height and breadth and length and depth. There is realms of God that no one has been willing to step into in this past 2,000 years. Nobody's been willing to tear themselves apart from the influence of Satan, which God has given us the rights to do. I pray that you make a plan with me. I made a 10-year plan. I just said, I said, forget about this thing now. I'm going to set a goal. I made a 10-year plan to come into the fullness, the measure, the maturity of the ministry of Jesus, even to a fully matured man. Because if you don't set a goal, and if you don't begin to go after it, you don't begin to set your heart to it, Father, this is what I want. This is what I know you want. I'm praying according to your will. This is what you said we're supposed to be. You're going to get lost along the way, distracted or discouraged, because there's a lot of stuff that's going to come to discourage you. But if you see Jesus take you by the hand, huh, and show you your authority and put your foot on his neck, Satan shall be crushed under your feet shortly, is what Paul said to the Romans. Think of, I want you to think about this with me, dear people. I want you to hold with me here just for just one more second. I want you to think about this with me. I want you to consider this. For the spiritual laws of life that are in Christ Jesus have made us free from the laws of sin and death. There's laws. There's spiritual laws being laid out. There's spiritual laws of sin and death, and there's spiritual laws of life that is in Christ Jesus. 
You're never going to step into this place and this dimension that God has for you until you're willing to ultimately resign yourself over to being taught by the Spirit of Truth, the Holy Ghost. To learn to hate the things he hates, to love the things he loves, to do the things he do, does, to refuse those things which belong to another realm. Father wants to teach you how to go forth in his power and his authority, conquering and subduing. Wherever the sole of your foot should walk, you have complete authority and dominion there. Who will come and follow Jesus? Who will receive the life of Jesus Christ? Lots of folks have said they receive the life of Jesus Christ, but I don't see his life being manifested. Because life is very distinct and is described in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and reproduced in his disciples who followed him in Acts through the epistles. All you have to do is say, from this day forward, I shall serve the Lord. From this day forward, I'm going to be commissioned by him. I, the commission. The commission. All authority is given to me in heaven and earth. Go. Go. <laughs> Go preach the good news. <laughs> Go. Go declare these things of God. Start living the life that you, God has called you to live. Don't be ashamed about shouting, thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise the Lord. Father, thank you for your goodness. This is a wonderful day that the Lord has made. Just be who you are in God. I told the guys out golfing, I said, you learn how to keep, you learn how to write down every stroke because there's not a better witness on the golf course than making sure you've got your score right here, okay? I mean, every area of your life, every area of your life, giving yourself to walking in the highest divine order as possible which is the divine order and life that Jesus Christ showed us. Hallelujah. Say this. Say, I'm not in charge. I'm not in charge. The Holy Ghost is. The Holy Ghost is. Now live that way. Now live that way. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ is calling you. He died for your sins at Calvary's cross. Not only died for your sins at Calvary's cross, not only did he suffer and bleed and die specifically for you, you that are standing here right now, but he made a way to where that you could be delivered out of the, the life that you've been living to come into a brand new life that's far superior to anything that you've ever understood. The scripture says that he, those that who have Jesus Christ have life, and they that do not have Christ Jesus do not have life, but they are dead while they live. Today, if you're sick of being dead, today, if you're sick of living your own life and you don't want this life that is in this world anymore, there is a way of escape. God's made it for you. There is a means for you to be liberated, and we can set you free at this very moment. We'll open up the prison door. You can come out. Hallelujah. We'll speak liberation to you, and God will give you a new heart and he'll give you a new spirit. Right where you stand. Right where you stand. Right where you stand. Now, in the name of Jesus, I destroy the power of every mind-blinding spirit. Now, in the name of Jesus Christ, everything that belongs to rebellion and pride and arrogancy, everything that belongs to stubbornness and blindness of heart, now, in Jesus' name, I destroy its power from off of you, that you may be able to freely receive from heaven, freely receive from Christ Jesus, live it, and freely give it. If there's anybody here today, you want to respond to this call. Jesus is calling you. If you don't know that you've been born again, Jesus said, unless you're born again, you cannot come into the realms of the kingdom. Not now and not later. If you aren't, if you aren't certain that you've been born again, born of the Holy Ghost, born of God, hallelujah, to be made one with Him, hallelujah, to live His life, hallelujah, to have His life, to live, Ooh then let that day be the, today. Let that moment be now. Don't wait. There's no reason to wait. You're free to decide. 
You're free to choose, free to receive. If you've been lukewarm, you better repent. Somebody said, you don't need to repent. You better repent. Jesus said, you better repent. It's the message of Jesus. He says, repent. If you look warm, repent. He said, I'll spew you out of my mouth. In other words, I'm in a fellowship with you. And that's the worst possible thing to hear the Lord say this. Because he, he classifies lukewarm with iniquity. He says concerning those of iniquity. He says, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I do not know you. You never stop sinning. He classifies the lukewarm in the same situation. He says, I'll spew you out of my mouth. In other words, he's saying, I have no fellowship with you. I do not know you. The only way not to be lukewarm is to be on fire in the fire. Huh? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now in Jesus' name. Now in Jesus' name. Hear the voice of the Lord. Harden not your heart. Harden not your heart, but hear. Let me just say this to you. Everything that you want will destroy you. Everything that God wants for you will give you life. It's just really that simple. Father makes a, a way for you and I to realize that what he wants for us is far better than what the deceptions played on us to make us believe that we want it. Because we, and you can see it's deception because people go and get it and they thought it was going to ultimately satisfy and all it did was just leave them empty. That much more empty because they thought they were going to be satisfied. Now they get there and they're just that much more empty because now what they were hoping to fulfill them is gone. Come on now. If I could get you to believe that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life here today, if you, could, if you would believe that one spiritual law, the spiritual law of life in Christ Jesus, that would be enough wisdom to keep you from here on out. Huh? You'd look at that lie and temptation and those things made to be that which you want and say, no, 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 uh-uh. It's not what I want. My heart's joined unto the Lord. I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you 10 more seconds. I'm going to give you 10 more seconds. I'm going to give you eight more seconds. I'm going to give you six more seconds. I'm going to give you four more seconds. I'm going to give you two more seconds. Time's up. That's what's going to happen to people. Suddenly, it's going to be a countdown of their life, and they're going to not really even know it. And suddenly, everything will change. Do you, let me just say this. Let me say this. I'm just closing because I'm just dealing with some people here. I want, I'm just, I want to get this out. Things can radically change in your life in one single day. One single day you were born. In one single day you'll die. In one single day, things can radically change for you. In one single day, you can step into everything that God has purposed for your life if you hunger for it, if you thirst for it. It's what the Lord has promised and He's faithful. He's not a liar. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I am pleading with some people in here today who try to live a double standard, to live a double life. I'm pleading with some people today who want to give God 50% of their life. They want to only do the will of the Lord when it's convenient for them. They want to only agree when it's what they agree with. And I'm asking you, I'm petitioning you today. I want you to recognize that you're no more right than the sinner. You're no more right than a person who doesn't believe. In fact, you may be less right than those who do not believe. Because if that light be in you is darkness, how well great is that darkness? You can't have it both ways. To have a right heart. I'm not saying that you got to be necessarily in any way or description, uh, you know, flawless in your behavior. All I am saying you got to have a right heart. You can't hear the word of the Lord come to you, come to you and say to do something. You say, no, I won't do it. And be right with God. You're going to have to recognize today that it's, it, you're going to have to choose whom you serve, yourself or, or the living God. Because I'm going to tell you right now, self-idolatry is just as bad as any other idolatry that has, ever, that has ever been around. Moloch. Or whoever else. And I think, I think Moloch's a good, a good second to you. You know what I'm saying? He's the one they sacrificed the babies to.
That should be, that should be something that we would abhor. And I'm sure everybody here does. I hope you can abhor yourself like that. If you would make yourself God. In the sense that you're going to obey your word and go with your word. I'm going to give 10 more seconds. Eight more seconds. Six more seconds. Countdown's going on in your life. Three more seconds. Time's up. The countdown of your life is underway. If you don't realize that, I'm here to tell you again today before you leave. Countdown of your life is underway. The countdown of your life is underway. The numbers of your day has already been set. They've already been determined by the Lord. The numbers of your days. You have nothing, no time to spare. You have no time to lose. In the name of Jesus Christ. Spare not, but completely. Turn everything over, liberally, generously, to the one who loved you so much. He ran the heavens and came down. He left all of his riches and became poor for your sake, that through his poverty you might be made rich. These are the days that God, Christ Jesus, will empower you if you're willing to go all the way with him. These are the days that your face will start shining with the glory of God. These are the days that he'll fill your mouth with his words from heaven. These are the days that he will use you beyond anything that you would have natural ability to use, be used otherwise. Hallelujah. He'll take the weak things, the despised things, the things. <laughs> that nobody else would have ever believed could be used. And take you. I'm telling you. You're not an exception. You're not an exception. I'm telling you, he's talking to you. There's no life that you'll ever live that could ever compare to being privileged to live the life of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Let everyone just lift your hands towards heaven. Say with me, say, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus I, surrender all. I surrender all. I give my whole heart to you. I give my whole life to you. I thank you that you died for me. I thank you that you rose again for me. I thank you that you seated in heaven for me. And that I'm seated together there with you right now. I thank you that you send the Holy Spirit so that I might burn with the fire of your presence. Lord, I give everything that I am and everything that I have over to your use to do your will. Use me, Lord. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. <laughs> ah! You said it. I think that the Lord's a lot more happy about it than you are. And I guarantee you, he took it serious. I mean, he just like, he, he's not like, a, he's not like, a, he's not like an offended spouse that says, oh, I don't really believe it. Words are cheap. He doesn't do that. He loves us so much. I pray today that you'll understand how much he loves you. Now, I want all of you just come worship the Lord with your offering. Now, I want to just say this. I want to say this. I want you to understand this. All worship is defined by offering. All worship has been defined by offering. It's been defined by offering. It's been defined by an offering. It's defined by an offering. Furthermore, it's a means by which God brings wealth into your life. It's a mean, I said it's a means by which God blesses you and prospers you financially. It's true. He said, even to those who give sparingly, you're still going to get rewarded. You're going to get a sparing harvest. 
Does he give generously? He gave generous harvest. This is the way God multiplies within our life financial provision. See? The smallest acts of obedience, the smallest acts of obedience create the greatest miracles of faith. Small act of obedience, calling upon the name of the Lord, creates a great miracle of salvation, a new heart, a new spirit. Smallest act of obedience, just worship the Lord, honoring the Lord. God described to Jacob saying all that he was going to do to bless him. And Jacob said, seeing as you're going to do this, I'm going to give you one-tenth of everything that you give to me. And he did so, I, he did so that he might remember first and foremost who gave it to him. And he did so also so that he might worship. It's so worship. An act of just honoring the Lord. So come honor the Lord with your substance and with all the first fruits of your increase. And I'll always be generous with God. Somebody says, well, I've got, I've got this and that in, the saving bit, in, in my saving account for this thing and that thing. Well, I hope that works. And I hope, I hope that, that your money works in heaven. I hope, they're based, I hope they're on the same monetary system over there. But I can tell you right now that I was just obviously being facetious because it ain't going to work. Find a bunch of people around you, bless them, tell them that you love them. If anybody needs prayer for anything, I'm here to pray with you, for you. Hallelujah. If you're sick in your body, 